Hello, A Pushers. JB here. Today is Jeffersonian Democracy and Jacksonian Democracy. We're going to compare both of these as these fall into period four. Period four being from 1800 to 1848. We're going to deal with these two individuals and their visions and how they impacted uh, American democracy, especially in the early 19th century. Now, I'm going to not have a bunch of primary sources in this presentation it's going to be really more content you know to try to find the connections and do the comparisons so this would be best used to target an SAQ or target an LEQ granted there may be a DBQ prompt based on this I'm sure there has been but if you want to try to target LEQ strategies especially since the LEQ does target one of the historical thinking skills of comparison look at it this way okay so just to begin with, we'll start with the two individuals. We're not going to get too much into their biographies. We have Thomas Jefferson, and in comparing him to Andrew Jackson, he inherited his wealth. He inherited his plantation in Virginia, the slaves that came with this. Uh, both men are slave owners. Uh, Jefferson comes from an inherited wealth, but he proved himself. He is. He was very brilliant. He was a statesman. When we say he was a statesman, he was a statesman. We're talking about involved in the Continental Congress. We're talking about the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. We're talking about an ambassador to France. We're talking about being vice president and then eventually being president. And of course, his very important role being Secretary of State to George Washington in his first cabinet. Then we go to Andrew Jackson. And he was born in the Carolina backcountry. So he's already, he doesn't have that natural elitism. So some people, like a Jefferson, will frown upon that based on their vision. He's a self-made man, uh, climbed the ranks, didn't have the means that Jefferson did. And over time, he becomes a war hero. He does serve as a senator. And then eventually he runs for president and will eventually win. So right here you have a comparison of the men themselves. Now let's get into their visions and do they, ref do, do they personally reflect that? And when they're president, do they practice what they believe? Okay. And of course we're going to see their impact of their vision on the United States as a whole. So potential historical thinking skills prompts to work with. These are suggestions. You can work with them if you want or modify them or use others. There's a compare and contrast of Jeffersonian democracy and Jacksonian democracy on their influence and influence of expanding American political and social values from that time period. Uh, we also have a periodization prompt here, uh, the election of 1828 as a turning point of American democratic values. And then a CCOT, continuity change over time, of how Jacksonian democracy maintained the continu continuities and foster, foster changes in the American political system from 1800 to 1850. These are suggestions, but they do target um, historical thinking skills that would be on the LEQ. Now we're going to do this thematically. Uh, we're going to start with the NAT uh, thematic learning objective and the idea of who, in, in Jefferson's vision and Jackson's vision, who is the ideal citizen and how should the republic really function. Going to Jeffersonian's vision, the Jeffersonian democracy, the ideal citizen is the yeoman farmer. That's Jefferson's perfect citizen. Why? Because the yeoman farmer is independent. Why is he independent? He acquired his land by his own means, and it's him. And whatever he grows on his land, whatever he builds on that land, that's his means of living. That's how he's going to support his family. That's how he's going to get through to life, get through in life. And he's beholden to no one. The only thing he's beholden to is nature. He's at the he's at the mercy of nature. And because he grows crops for himself, that means he doesn't have to go to the market uh, to, to purchase. He, because it's his land, it's his own labor. So he's doing it based, you know, if he's going to survive, he's going to do it on the fruits of his own labor. That means he's not a factory worker. He's not, he's not working in the city. He's not, he doesn't have a manager. He doesn't have an owner to, to answer to. He answers to himself. And that's what Jefferson was trying to get at, that independence. Because when you have that independence, then you're going to vote your conscience. You're not going to vote 
what you, what influences you. There's not an owner saying, hey, if you want to keep your job, make sure you vote for this person or vote this way. Jefferson says that's why we have to have a nation of yeoman farmers. And, of course, farmers being that he wants an agrarian society. We'll talk about that later. And here's the thing about uh, when we compare that to what Jacksonian democracy is, the common man. Now that's anybody. That is the factory worker. That is the artisan. That is the person that may live in the city. It, it, it is also the yeoman farmer, but that's that's what Jacksonian democracy is, is. So when you compare this, you say, like, wow, that maybe that's more democratic because Jacksonian democracy says, hey, any citizen, uh, technically white male citizen, it, that, that, that has a job, you know, you know, works, you know, factory owner, common laborer, and you don't have to have property. Well, there you go. That That is true democracy, relatively speaking. So right there, you have these two distinct ideal citizens between them. Now, this links us into the voting. So we talked about the voting and in Jeffersonian democracy, you have to have property. And why do you need to have property? Well, it fulfills the idea of Jefferson says, well, that's we want responsible people. We want uh, uh, intelligent people. And when people have land and they're able to work that land successfully, then that means they know what they're doing. And so we want those types of people voting for representatives. That's kind of a natural elite. OK, we're heading toward that. Jacksonian democracy says no property requirements. This is democracy. OK, and you can vote your conscience no matter what. If you're influenced, you're influenced. But a no more property requirements. That's just not fair. We're, we're, we're living in an age where there's the beginning of industrialization and the, the, the growth of urbanization and quite frankly, running out of land. So, you know, we have to open this up and, and there are other influences or other interests. There are other aspects of the economy and of society as the nation grows and moves on. So we have to, we have to, you know, the democracy has to uh, adapt and evolve as well. Well, Jefferson, you know, he knew that was going to happen, but that's what he still wanted the natural elites to be in charge when he didn't want just anyone running for office. He wanted someone that was of, of, of significant intelligence, uh, that understood the political system. That's why he thought he was perfect for the job. And he didn't just want a common person doing it because as we talked about with the founders, when they set up the constitution and you read the federalist papers, they're not fond of the people. The people are greedy. It's, it's you know, the idea of factions and that they're self-interested. And so these natural elites that have a means as in land, going back to that yeoman farmer and the property requirement, they understand responsibility they understand what it means to be independent because of that responsibility so that's why we want them in charge of the well-being of the nation they're the best representatives of the people we want to dilute those self-interest that you know people depend and the the, the 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 dependence that some people may have that's why we want the natural elites in charge in jacksonian democracy no no we don't want natural elites we want loyalty and uh, this is where we get introduced to the spoil system and yes do we want the best person for the job that would be nice yes that would make sense but then again you know the best person for the job may not be the most loyal or is in tune with what jackson believes or what you know in his political philosophy or his uh you know or, or the or the platform or agenda of the political party the democrats uh for example and so we're going to reward loyalty and if you have an idea of what commerce is or or what the state department does or what the bank does or you know any 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 bureaucratic agency we're gonna stick in loyals loyal uh, servants to the party and not just anyone but you figure it's like well that is just ripe for cor corruption you know that's you know they were trying you know jefferson wanted to avoid that with uh you know against hamilton you know the, the you know he felt that hamilton was too linked to the business interests to the bankers to the inherited wealth you know he thought that was going to be corrupt well the the idea of the loyalty and just putting in your friends and that sense of almost nepotism do you want you know it, that 
you know, you could just buy in, you know, you could just say, yeah, I want to, I just want to support the party. That way I can get a job. Well, Jackson had a solution for that. And that was the rotation of office. And, you know, we say like, all right, you're going to spend uh, only some time in here. You know, you know, after a year, we'll move you around. We'll move you to another agency and you can work there. And we'll get somebody new in there, get some fresh blood. Because that was Jackson saying, I get what you're trying to do with the corruption because we don't want to keep people in the same agency, in the same executive department, because they could consolidate power. And that is against the people. All right. They could they could start putting in that that one person could start putting in his allies and, and, and his types of people from his types of his type of social class. And so that's why we're going to rotate that office. Of course, then again, it, it really depends on how you apply this. And of course, there is reality. So like some people said, they say, well, what if, we, what if you know, you're rewarding loyalty? Well, what happens if you don't get you get somebody in there that really doesn't know what they're doing? Well, going back to Jeffersonian democracy, Jefferson really promoted education. He felt that people need to understand uh, how the system works, how politics works, the, the natural rights, the, the philosophy behind it. And he thought, yes, he, he, he was a very supportive of public education. And of course, this goes with the natural elites. The Jacksonian believed that education was not a priority. It wasn't as, as a priority as Jefferson thought, or as even 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 the contemporary people like John Quincy Adams. They felt that, you know, maybe, you know, kind of synthesizes to today where you don't really knock someone. If you're a politician, you don't really knock someone's degrees, you know, or lack of degrees. You know, it comes across as elitist, you know, and, and, and maybe in the, because the nation is... Uh, uh, significantly uh, uneducated, and I say that as in not there's a big number that, of people that are not college graduates that don't have a bachelor's, and that number just keeps dwindling and dwindling because so much smaller, uh, single digit percentages when you talk about people with masters and then doctorates. So, how is that? How are you going to put these these natural elites with this with this with this amazing education? Are that is that representative of the people? You know, a you know maybe a degree doesn't doesn't define who you are. Okay, maybe it just comes with experience, or just you never had the opportunity. Look at Jackson. He's like, hey, it was tough for me, but I had to do what I had to do. You know, Jefferson, he he walked into it. He was born into it, and so the, the education was not such a high priority. And there are other aspects of why education is not a high priority because uh, you talk about the South and you know the the slavery and only, you know, the, 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 even the white society in the South, only plantation, sons of plantation owners would be able to afford to get an education. And even then they sent them up North. So education was a priority. And yet the Democrats, the Jacksonian Democrats represented the South very much. So there's that other, uh, aspect to the idea of education. Now to keep going about democracy, I was like, all right, in Jeffersonian democracy, how do you select these leaders? Okay, how do you get these people that these natural elites that are educated that have property? How do you how do we select uh, the candidates? And under Jeffersonian democracy, it was through party caucuses. The party leaders chose who was running. They said, "You're going to run." All right, people, this is the person we propped them up there. Maybe because they felt this is the best person for the job. That's understandable. He has the best interest of the people in mind. Uh, that could be the ideal per, uh, point of view there. However, Jacksonian Democrats and the Jacksonian under Jacksonian democracy, the anti Masonic party came around and said, "Hey, how about a national convention where delegates of the party uh, met and decided through a more democratic process to choose who they who they wanted on the on the ticket on their party ticket," and this caught on. Uh, very well. It, it, eventually, the Democratic Party and then the Whig Party took on these national conventions, uh, and delegates from the states met, and that's where you have these conventions, and that's true today. And the delegates decide who gets, uh, you know, who, who gets their votes from the states, and whoever's got uh, a certain amount of votes, you know, a majority, however the party structures it, then that becomes the candidate, and that's much more democratic. Now, these last two are more, you know, could be 
overlapped with, yes, the national identity, but also with America and the world. In Jeffersonian democracy, this empire of liberty is very similar, and you can synthesize this back to City Upon a Hill. And you say that America, under Jefferson, we are that 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 bright and sh shining light to, to the world that says, this experiment, this democratic experiment, this republic is going to work, and we're going to prove that, and we're going to we're going to practice these values, and we're going to show everyone that we are right, that we're heading in the right direction. We want the world to follow in our footsteps, and you know we're going to spread these ideals. We do this not only in our border, within our borders, but also we're going to we purchase the Louisiana territory. And we're going to spread our ideals, and we're just going to model this to the world. Jacksonian democracy continues that but you can dive deeper with manifest destiny manifest destiny is just basically yes expansion just fueling the expansion and i wouldn't say that manifest destiny was a major drive in under the jeffersonian democracy we just want to model what we get and yes getting the louisiana territory that's great but do we want to keep going manifest destiny is like yes 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 but you have to think in the time in context so with Manifest Destiny, what's going on? What are the driving forces? And yes, there are economic, as in, you know, getting more resources. Uh, we are having population spikes. And of course, we have sectionalism brewing when it comes to free states and slave states. And so the Jacksonian Democrats say, yes, let's, we want to push Manifest Destiny so we can expand uh, a faction of our party that wants to expand slavery. And that's where you dive deep, and that's where you have to show your kids uh, a good, under uh, deep, in-depth understanding of history. And you say, "Wow, is the Jacksonian Democrat is Jacksonian democracy more democratic?" And you're like, "Oh, okay, yeah." And I go, "Yeah, well, you just spread slavery." So there's your little counter argument, you know. So like, yeah, it's democratic. They're talking about values, and you know, you have the common man and universal male suffrage, but you're also pursuing manifest destiny. Yeah, you're expanding those ideals, but you're also doing it to expand slavery, which obviously is not democratic. And so that's something that can be discussed, or at least, you know, you facilitate that kind of discussion with your students. So hopefully this this theme, you've seen the, uh, the, the, the comparisons, the similarities, and the differences. All right, we're going to move on to politics and power. And we're going to really look at the scope of federal power, the what the Constitution had granted, uh, you know, the federal government. And obviously Jefferson had a big part in, <laughs> in believing on what the, what the scope of the federal power was, especially since he was a big states' rights guy. And his big beef was with Alexander Hamilton. And Alexander Hamilton was a strong central government guy. And obviously one of the, you know, they had their major battles and, you know, the bank, we'll talk about the bank, and you know you know the debt plan hamilton's debt plan well let's get more into the state's rights and one episode we can talk about is the alien and sedition acts during john adams administration in the 1790s and the uh, the jeffersonian democrats or the democratic republicans well thomas jefferson and james madison wrote the virginia and kentucky resolutions and those virginia and kentucky resolutions established the concept of nullification that states when they believe the federal government passed a law or enforced a law in a way that was against the interest of the people or the states that the states could nullify it that nope doesn't no we're not gonna it doesn't apply here sorry charlie that is if they're the you know they have this kind of uh judicial review and even though jefferson when he becomes president kind of <laughs> you know as a you know when he becomes president he kind of you know, there's the episode of the Embargo Act, and he kind of expands the power of the federal government and tells states this is how you're going to enforce the embargo and gives them, uh, you know, a significant amount of power. Yeah, I get you. But let's, so you have the theory of nullification there, and you have the states' rights. And as Jefferson's president, yes, there are some hypocritical issues. Um, but let's go to Jackson. Let's go to Jacksonian democracy. And yes, Jackson himself was a big states' rights guy, too. And so when you have the idea of nullification come in, well, Jackson probably would have subscribed to that as long as it wasn't a threat to the Union. And there was an issue where John C. Calhoun, 
who Andrew Jackson hated. And, you know, we all know that Jackson hated Clay, Henry Clay, but hated John C. Calhoun. And John C. Calhoun used the theory of nullification to nullify the Tariff of Abominations, or Tariff of 1828, which felt, you know, as, as, as these high tariffs, these high protective tariffs, threatened the states, uh, so the southern states to be exact, in regards to that it would, it would hurt, uh, you know, ag- agriculture and farmers. So this, this prompted the nullification crisis. And, you know, long story short, it got to the point where Jackson said, I get what you're trying to get at, but this is a, I'm going to preserve the Union. And South Carolina's actions and John C. Calhoun's beliefs threaten the idea of the Union. And I will use force, if need, to go in there into South Carolina and get rid of these nullifiers. So, you know, it, it's states' rights to a degree. Uh, as long as the union is preserved, so there there is a sense of commonality. Both men, states' rights, both ideologies, states' rights, but union, union. And, you know, Jackson, when it came to uh, the idea of annexation of Texas, is like, mm, I don't know, I don't know, I, I don't want to deal with that, really. And I can see why. Uh, and eventually, you know, the, you know the story after that. So, what about reading the Constitution? Strict constructionists, the both of them, they are both literal interpret. They literally interpret the Constitution, uh, or do they? <laughs> that's the that's the question. You know, as we saw with Jefferson's presidency, uh, maybe. And strict constructionist, as in, well, one major issue would be the bank. And Thomas Jefferson said, "Well, there's no bank in the Constitution, therefore it cannot exist." And that's why there was a big beef with Hamilton. However, uh, it was necessary and proper, so that was a loose interpretation among the Federalists and Hamilton, and that was going to be a major issue, of course, with Jackson uh, when it comes to the bank, but I'm going to save the bank for later uh, for a more important theme, and when it comes to the strict constructionists, I think one good angle with Jackson would be the Maysfield Road, and the Maysfield Road was, uh, was going to be an infrastructure project. And during this time, we have uh, the American system by Henry Clay, and one component of that is to develop the nation's infrastructure. Uh, as we get into this, you know, we're in the middle of the market revolution, we're in this transportation revolution, you have canals, you have national roads, you know, you have these steamships going around on these rivers, and and, and, and the Jacksonian Democrats embrace this, by the way. They embrace the, the idea of, you know, you know industrializing and, and developing this infrastructure, but the Maysfield Road is only going to be built in in the state of Kentucky, and when it you know went through Congress, and when Jackson gets it, he says he vetoes it, and one of his, you know his his his, uh, his justification was is that since it's only being built in Kentucky, that it, it doesn't cross state lines, this this is a violation of the Constitution. Uh, federal funds can't go to just to a, to a project that is only within the state hands. It, it, you know, it's intra-state, not inter-state commerce. So Jackson, uh, obviously using this opportunity to kind of get at Clay, but hey, it you know it's a strict constructionist argument. Now let's get into the these elections. Uh, actually, some pretty cool comparisons here. So. In the elections of 1796 and 1800, uh, you have two re- you have a rematch of in 1796 it was John Adams, the first contested election between John Adams, uh, the Federalist, and Thomas Jefferson of the Democratic Republicans or Republicans. And John Quincy, Ad- I'm sorry, John Adams wins this, and Jefferson, you know, felt you know, eh. but the way it was set up under the Constitution was that second place is vice president. So you have John Quincy. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, you have John Adams of one party, and you have Thomas Jefferson as vice president of another party, and that's just crazy. And throughout those four years of Adams' term, Jefferson does what he can to undermine Adams' administration. Although the Federalists have their own little internal squabbles uh, between Adams and Hamilton. However, in the rematch of 1800. This is considered a turning point of uh, of, uh, of, of the American political system in the regards to that, well, this is a revolution of 1800. 
And in this rematch between Adams and, and Jefferson, Jefferson wins, and the Democratic Republicans also win Congress. They take it. They take Congress from the Federalists, and it's a peaceful transition. And it's that's yay, awesome, fantastic. And it was a bitter, bitter battle, by the way. These two parties and these two men, despite being friends, uh, it, it just did fell apart. It fell apart in 1796, and in 1800, we're talking about very bitter uh, newspaper editorials, you know, s some very uh, inflammatory remarks. It, it, it was bad. It, it was really bad. Um, but, you know, you know, the rest is history. But then we go, let's go to the elections of 1824 and 1828. And in 1824, it's, you have John Quincy Adams... Okay, the son of John Adams, you have Andrew Jackson, you have William Crawford, and you have Henry Clay. And you're, if you're wondering, it's like, well, what are the parties? And I go, well, at this point, we're in the era, you're toward the end of the era of good feelings, and there, there really is no more national federalist party. It, it died. It died off, you know, after the War of 1812. So basically, you have all these Democratic Republicans. Everyone's a Democratic Republican. Not really. See, you have two factions, two major factions of the Democratic Republicans that are, have evolved. And through over the era of good feelings, you had these Democratic Republicans that were old school Jeffersonian types, you know, the states' rights kind of kind of uh, Democratic Republicans. Um, and that's where Jackson and uh, Crawford kind of headed toward. And then you had um, these these Democratic Republicans that were big on Federalist ideas, and they <laughs> basically adopted the platform. They said, you know, the bank is kind of a good idea. And they said, this infrastructure, pretty good idea. And protective tariffs, good ideas. Hamilton had it right, and did, because Hamilton's the man. So Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams went, went, went that way. So you do have these two factions within the party. And in 1824... It ends up uh, neither gets neither one of those four gets the electoral majority, so it goes to the House of Representatives to choose, and it's only the top three. So that only leaves Jackson, who got the plurality, by the way, got the most electoral votes. John Quincy Adams and then William Crawford, and Henry Clay, being Speaker of the House, which is interesting. Um, Supposedly, he's going to use his influence to sway the House of Representatives to go to John Quincy Adams, his buddy. And this is where we get the corrupt bargain. And in the corrupt bargain, you have uh, Henry Clay, who was Speaker of the House, become Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams' administration. And throughout most of the time, it was basically a virtual given that if you're Secretary of State, you're going to be President. It, it, it happened with Thomas Jefferson, it happened with James Madison, it happened with James Monroe, we go on the whole list. And that's where the Jacksonian Democrats lost their minds, called it the corrupt bargain, said, you see, these elitists, they're consolidating power, oh, it's just like the old times. You know, it's just like what the Democratic Republicans talked about with the Federalists who leaned to too much to the British with Hamilton and wanting to go back to a monarchy. And now these these. Jacksonian Democrats say, oh, the corrupt bargain, these elitists. So you have that. And so Jackson vows revenge. And so we get the election of 1828, a rematch of John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. And another bitter, bitter campaign, just like we saw in, uh, in the previous elections between Adams and Jefferson. It is a bitter, bitter, bitter campaign. Uh, you know, lies are thrown, and, and it gets it gets really, really uh, out there when it comes to the uh, inflammatory accusations. But Jackson wins overwhelmingly. The Jacksonian Democrats uh, are able to take are able to take Congress as well. And boom, there you go. You have you have another victory for democracy, as we saw in eighteen hundred. And so, just to give you a second here. Um, so we'll talk about the uh, how these elections, uh, the 1800 and uh, 1828 or 1824, uh, it, it are so impactful that you know it's it, it pretty much uh, are major parts of the first party and second party system. Uh, the first party system being the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, and that election, I argue, 
that the election of 1824 is the turning point. It's the turning point when the first party ends and the second party system begins. And the first party system, uh, yes, federalist, strong central government, and you have the Democratic Republican states' rights. And it's really just two, those two national parties. It really is. So, but when we go to the second party system, after uh, 1824, and you can argue 1828, the second party system is similar to the first party system in that you have the Democrats. The Democratic Republicans evolve into the Democrats. And those are your Jackson Democrats. Their states' rights and their manifest destiny, but they're also slave power. But who's the other party? Who's the second party? Well, the National Republicans will then turn into the Whigs. So the Whigs are basically Federalist 2.0. They're it's the American system, which is basically an evolution of Hamilton's uh, vision. Okay, and American uh, American system has three major components: the central bank, infrastructure, and protective tariffs. That is the American system. But what distinguishes the second party system from the first party system? Second party system is has a lot of is more um, more people are involved, obviously because of universal male suffrage, and they're very close elections, by the way. In the first party system, Federalists were basically saying we got the we got New England, we got the Northeast, that's our region, and the Democratic Republicans had the South and the West, and that basically what it was. That's what it was. But in the second party system, yes, would you find Whigs in the Northeast? Yes, but actually, the the elections between a Whig and a Democrat in just about any state was very close. It, I mean, you could be a Whig in Virginia, you could be a Whig in Tennessee, you could be a Democrat in Massachusetts. It wasn't. It was the. the it was much more. It was even more evenly split, I should say, in in these states when it comes to the, these two national parties. And the other distinction, the second party system from the first party system, is that there's actually a third voice, a fourth voice, actually a fifth voice, because you have minor parties or third parties, the Liberty Party, the Anti Masonic Party, which actually was their primary was anti Mason Freemasons. It was you know whatever. Um, and you have the, the eventually the states' rights party. Uh, I'm sorry, um, the Free Soil Party, and uh, the Liberty Party. I mean, you have these these third parties, this other voice out there, and that hey, that's more democratic. So with especially with the national conventions, um, there you go. You you have a distinction from the first party system. Now, Jefferson. And the Jeffersonian Democrats, uh, Je Jeffersonian democracy, uh, believed that the that Congress was the supreme branch. Out of the three, you should have a strong legislature. Makes sense. You have a house that's directly elected by the people, that is proportion, you know, and is based on proportional representation, and you have a Senate that at this point is uh, chosen by the states, based on equal representation, and so that is the entity in the federal government that is closest to the people and that's why it should be the strongest and basically it should be the legislature's agenda that should be driving the country not the president's and certainly not the court well jacksonian democracy actually you know says like yes yes strong legislature but a stronger executive the president is a representation of the nation as a whole See, in the House, you have a representative, but he represents that one district. And so you have these hundreds of men from all their different districts, and they're voting based on their district. And the Senate is voting based on their state. The president represents the whole nation, all the districts, all the states. He's the one person that has to consider all interests. And so he should have a strong agenda, and he should have a strong platform, and, and he's going to be the best person to take care of the people. And Andrew Jackson says, I am one of you. I was a self-made man. I am a common man, and I am going to make sure that you are protected and that your interests are going to be satisfied.
And so there's a stronger executive. Um, not to try to consolidate power, although he could be accused of this, King Andrew the First. Okay, but the idea of that the president's much more representative of the people is the perspective that that is distinct from the Jeffersonian democracy. And now let's talk about the Supreme Court. And we under for most of the time under Jeffersonian democracy, we had the Marshall Court. Now, yes, the Federalists lost the presidency and Congress in eighteen hundred, but they always had the courts. They always had the courts. And despite Jefferson saying, oh man, I'm really, really, really scared about that court. And I, we need to keep that very, very weak. They're unelected. Okay, they serve for life. And they, they, they basically answer to nobody. And yet, <laughs> we get Marbury v. Madison and John Marshall, one of the strongest Federalists ever, decided to establish judicial review and said, hey, you... Thanks, Jefferson. You just made it stronger. You just made the Supreme Court even more, even stronger. And now we have a judicial review. It's not in the Constitution, but it, it, yeah, we'll we'll just think it is. Okay. And then you have cases, another case like McCulloch v. Maryland, that justified the bank. And 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 reinforced the supremacy clause. You uh, so this is the necessary and proper clause in the supremacy clause. The bank is legit. It's constitutional as a necessary and proper, and uh, the states are subservient to the federal government. All laws are, 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 you know, are again the supreme law of the land, and Maryland can't tax the federal bank, uh, this national bank. So you have a stronger federal government due to the uh, Marshall Court. You go over the Jacksonian democracy, and even though Marshall's uh, the, the chief justice uh, throughout uh, Jackson's administration uh, for some time of it. Uh, eventually, Marshall will, yes, you know, the longest serving Chief Justice, he does go the way of the dodo, and Jackson will appoint the second longest uh, tenure of a Supreme of a Chief Justice, and that's Roger Taney. And Roger Taney is a states' rights kind of guy, basically a huge 180 of Marshall. And it's interesting because there's all, there's going to be plenty of states' rights, uh, pro states' rights decisions. Uh, uh, this is the same Tawny that wrote the majority decision of the Dred Scott case. So you, you know there you go, and then you have this this case here, Charles River Bridge v. Warren Bridge. What was happening was that this is in Massachusetts, and uh, this one company, this one bridge, uh, it's old, it's been around. And this other company says, well, we want to build a bigger, better bridge, and we're going to charge tolls. And so the one bridge company said, well, that's going to take away, you know, hey, we, you can't do that. It's going to take away our profits. People are going to use the, the better bridge. And so this went to court, and basically the charge was that the state of Massachusetts was violating the contracts clause. There's something about the Constitution that you should you should uh, push for your kids, and this goes even when the Constitution starts, is that very, very protective of private property. Love private property. Uh, that's the contracts clause. And the, uh, a related case would be the Dartmouth case. Um, and so Tani said, you know what? No, you cannot have a monopoly on this on, on bridges this you know so they granted they told that you know uh they they actually ruled in favor of Ma the state of massachusetts that granted this company a better bigger bridge to build it and then collect tolls uh be and and this this really freed it up this this actually not only was a victory for states rights this also was a victory for allowing more private enterprise and 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 corporations to say, yeah, hey, you know what? There, no one has a monopoly. Let's uh, let's let's open it up, and this will help to to develop the nation's infrastructure. And so that tells you that it's not that the Jacksonian Dem Democrats were against the American system as a whole. They did want better infrastructure. They just had some philosophical differences on how to approach this. And so this 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 decision is a states' rights victory. But it also helps with, you know, helping to expand the nation and, and these values. So that's something to, to discuss. Pretty good case here. Okay, so we got politics and power down. Um, now let's go to the economic policy, work exchange, and technology. And it's pretty simple. Uh, Jeffersonian democracy and Jacksonian democracy believe in laissez-faire economics. Let it be. 
okay? Uh, we don't need the federal government coming in and telling us what to do, all right? N limited regulation is what we want. Um, and let the market free itself. And this is very important because, especially in the late term of Jeffersonian democracy, you're going to get the market revolution. Uh, Jacksonian democracy, it's just, you know, the early industrial revolution and the economy starting to really pick up. So, yeah, limited regulation. Go, go, go business. Do what you got to do. This is awesome. All right. Don't let the, uh, don't let the American, you know, don't let the federal government get in your way. Um, and then they'll try, you know, the federal government wants to entice it. That's what the American system was trying to do. It was trying to entice it, you know, especially with the infrastructure. It's like, yeah, let's try to subsidize here and there. Uh, but it's just the rules and the regulations. But, difference. See, Jefferson wanted an agrarian society. He wanted farmers, yeoman farmers, farm, 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 agricultural, agriculture, agriculture, agriculture. That's where we should go. And he distrusted industry. He distrusted banks and commerce in regards to, uh, you know, banking and, 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 and stocks and that sort of thing. Distrusted because... Th that that only further dependence and agrarian society makes it much more independent and so he wanted to focus the nation on an agrarian agricultural economy jacksonian democracy embraced industrialization they they saw the potential and they they they, they said yes go for it we, it doesn't matter i mean this is great this is just great for the nation build bridges uh build steamships let's build some roads let's build canals let's get some industries factories remember they're common man they, 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 you go back to the common man and, and uh, you know, we don't care about the yeoman farmer. We're, that's not our ideal citizen. Our ideal citizen is a common man. And if that means an industrial worker, then that's an industrial worker. They saw the prosperity that was there. And they said, let's, let's do it. Let's go for it. And so they embraced that market revolution. And, it, you know, whether it's industry or agriculture, whatever works. And now the bank. Okay, very important. Jefferson hated the bank but he you know they compromised on this and they got Hamilton's bank and so he got the first bank of the United States all right and I just want to time out for a second so even when Jefferson becomes president he doesn't do anything to the bank he leaves it there he realizes that it's it is necessary it's, his bank is necessary uh, and actually the bank and Hamilton's debt plan was able to help, uh, you know, help finance the purchase of the Louisiana territory. Um, now, however, the first bank of the United States charter is going to expire during Madison's administration, Madison being a protege of Jefferson. However, uh, quite quickly they realized that, oh my God, we need the bank, uh, especially with the aftermath of the War of 1812 and, you know, the, you know, there's inflation and then there's, you know, the, the, the post-war uh, collapse that happens because we're not, you know, it's not a, it's not a buyer's market anymore in this, uh, in this, in the sense of, um, you know, the, you know, oh, we have a, we're buying stuff for the war, then there's no more war, so we don't have to buy anymore. So then the economy starts dipping and, and then uh, they realize, oh my God, we we need a cent that central we central banking institution to keep things in line. So the bank will be recharted, and you get the second bank of the United States. Well, by the time Jackson becomes president, uh, not in the beginning, but he hates the bank. He hates it. He hates it. And when they try to, when people like Nicholas Biddle, Henry Clay, they try to push the re you know recertification of the bank's charter. Uh, Jackson takes the opportunity to say, no, I'm going to kill it. I think it is, you know, this den of vipers and it, it, it's only uh, consolidating power. Nicholas Biddle is only trying to, you know, he's putting it in his, his own people there. Remember, this bank is not a public agency. It's, it's quasi-public. It's, it's, it's actually more private than it is public. And that scares Jackson. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Nothing scares Jackson. But that was the, the problem. Was is that who do they answer to? Who do they answer to? Do they answer to the people? Well, this is not a democratic institution. This is this is this is the you know we're at the whim of these people. They control the economy. They could they could make or break us. You know whatever whatever policies they run, whatever monetary policies they in, institute, we're at their mercy. 
and he believed that this this was this was uh, uh, an institution controlled by the elites and we need to make it much more democratic so i'm going to destroy the bank and i'm going to take the federal deposits in the in the second bank of the united states and i'm going to put them in state banks or pet banks he didn't put them in all the state banks he put them in all the state banks that were loyal to him uh and eventually the bank would die it was it didn't get rechartered and Jackson defeated the bank and a victory for the people and a victory for democracy. Yes. And then we get the panic of 1837. Uh, yeah. So, you know, is it, is it democracy? Yeah. You could say that. Um, did it help out the nation? Well, I don't know. You know, defeating the bank and, you know, there are different views of the bank and one thought it was, necessary you know he hated the idea but he kind of just let it be and then jackson really took it as a personal vendetta and there you go all right now i'm going to take another pause to the next okay american culture and society c-u-l under jeffersonian democracy uh you, you were still under the age of enlightenment and the philosophy there is and I, you know, this is the age of reason and rationalization. And this is where, you know, tabula rasa, people like John Locke, you know, people learn from their, uh, their experiences and, you know, say his second treatise of government inspires the declaration of independence and natural rights based on natural law. And the more, you know, reasonable approach to how society functions and this is what has inspired our Declaration of Independence and our United States Constitution and that it was Jefferson's approach and so uh, you get the you get the ideas of like, like why it makes sense to provide democracy because it is natural law then in Jacksonian democracy there's uh, really move uh, big movements going on you have uh, the Second Great Awakening, you have Romanticism, and you have Transcendentalism. And I like to point out Transcendentalism in, uh, in when you uh, compare it to the Enlightenment here. In Transcendentalism, in Romanticism, as, as you know, related in a related uh, philosoph philosophical uh, distinction, rejected uh, rationalism. It wanted more uh, of, of the individual to recognize uh, a, its, its spiritual strength and not necessarily just use his mind and, and not just, oh, you're based on, you're based on experiences. And, and, and transcendentalists believe there's so much more than that. You had to be, you had to become in touch with nature. You had to become in touch with the universe and that it, it was just more than what was written down in a book and what logic told you. There, you know, that, that in instinct, you know, what about, what about the, the fact that you're going to make this decision, not because it makes much more sense or because logic dictates it, but because you have that gut feeling, you just have the sense, some kind of force out there is saying maybe we should go left and not right and you're only doing it because you just think that or should say feel that left is the proper way to go and you know being in touch more in that spiritual sense really helped to kind of you know expand democracy because it, it, it helped to inspire reform groups and these reform groups uh, became uh, abolitionism it became uh, women's suffrage. It became penal reform. It became education reform. All these reforms. Uh, the idea of uh, alcohol being that, that, that vice, okay, prostitution, gambling, all right? The idea of, uh, you know, Prohibition is uh, getting getting uh, talked about, okay, to to improve society, and of course to expand democracy as well. 
we want a better society. We want to have we want to have more competent people. We want to have we want to have uh, a much more understanding of how society works. And so, it you know it's a, it's 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 a philosophical uh, distinction in that enlightenment. It's like you know logic, reason, transcendentalism. It's you feel, you, you 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 believe, and and both yes reform society. But to what degree? It's something to think about. You have this, these major reforms and. And so let's get more into that in regards to society. So that was more of the Enlightenment Transcendental provides a more cultural aspect to this. But then you have the society and you get women. Let's talk about women. Well, under Jeffersonian democracy, the major idea here is Republican motherhood. The mother is responsible for the upbringing of children as responsible, educated citizens that understand what the American Revolution was about what dem democracy is, what republicanism is, what these ideals are, what their rights are, that is the responsibility of the mother. And unfortunately, under Jefferson, women are still considered second-class people. I am not going to say citizens, because they can't vote, and Jefferson thinks they shouldn't vote. So democracy, not so much. But let's see, does Jackson have a different idea? And now we go over here and we got cult of domesticity. And the cult of domesticity is where women have an increased role as not only educating amazing educated citizens, but also moral citizens. Very moral citizens. Very moral people. The mother is the foundation of the family as for its morals uh, and they 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 command the private sphere the men they are the only ones that should enter into the public sphere and the women uh, need to be married they they need to be submissive and they need to make sure that the house is in order and that everyone is on a moral uh, uh, you know they have a moral foundation oh and they can't vote yet even though we have a suffrage movement uh, brewing, uh, no voting yet. So, you have some similarities and you have a uh, minor difference, I would say. But, um, it's, you know, when you connect it to what's going on uh, contextually in Jacksonian democracy with transcendentalism, with the Second Great Awakening, uh, with the reform movement, uh, it's starting to look good for women. It's not, it's not yet. Then we have... Uh, African Americans, and really slavery. We, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about slavery. And under Jeffersonian democracy, you have slavery considered as a necessary evil. Jefferson himself was a slave owner, and he thinks it's disgusting. But we cannot. You can't get rid of slavery, not yet. It will die. It will die. It, it, it's it. They know. The founders know that it will die a certain death, and it's it's coming quick. And but they have to deal with the politics of the now, and you know that's why I had the three fifths compromise in the Constitution. And what they didn't realize was technology, and eventually the cotton gin, seventeen ninety three, and as time goes on, especially under Jefferson democracy, we see that slavery is going to be expanding, and this necessary evil is going to turn into a positive good. Imagine that. You go to Jacksonian democracy, and good old John C. Calhoun is giving a speech in Congress about slavery being a positive good. And here's another aspect of slavery in, in regards to democracy, when you relate to democracy, is that Congress tended to practice the gag rule in that we don't talk about the peculiar institution. We don't say slavery. We don't deal with that. Slave power is so is becoming so much stronger during under Jacksonian democracy. It's expanding under Manifest Destiny. It's being justified in many ways politically to keep the balance economically. To the, the cotton has expanded throughout the South and is feeding northern textile industries, just feeding the 
commercial activity between the regions north west and south and the foreign markets socially there's still that sense of white superiority and black inferiority culturally you know the sense that hey it's this is a positive good we're doing our moral duty to christianize uh african-americans uh and as they come from africa you know christianize them and provide them uh you know the benefit of of sanctuary uh and of course uh explaining them democracy in a certain point of view but you can see what's happening is that under jacksonian democracy quote unquote slavery is expanding and expanding and expanding now let's go to native americans Jefferson considered natives, um, you know, subscribed to the idea of being the noble savage, and he looked at natives as they had potential. They had potential. They were just lagging behind, and they could they could keep, they could catch up with uh, white American culture if they embraced white American culture, if they embraced agriculture, uh, if they were taught, if they were Americanized. Uh, you know, politically and economically, especially, and if they just embrace white American culture, then they will be just as successful as as white Americans. Uh, so the level of equality between natives and white Americans, Jefferson was open to the idea, um, but he did, you know, he did enact policies that, you know, said, hey. I'm sorry, natives, but I'm not going to respect your culture. I, I'm going to, you know, you, you need to respect American culture and either take it or leave it. Well, Jackson wasn't exactly as um, diplomatic toward the natives as Jefferson or anybody else before that. Jackson, of course, uh, fought the natives uh, in the Seminole Wars. <clears throat> And, of course, what signed the Indian Removal Act. And he doesn't respect their culture. He doesn't respect their rights. He believes that that land is American land. And they can, you know, will sign treaties. And basically, it's how it works. You can stay there as long as you start conforming to the economic interests of the nation. We're going to use that land uh, for, you know, plantations. We're going to use that land for... Uh, you know, expansion of slavery, expansion of cotton, expansion of any crops, any cash crops that we need to. If you can't do that, then goodbye. To leave. And eventually this, you know, this leads to the traumatic uh, event of the Trail of Tears. And Jackson was, you know, that's the way it is. We have manifest destiny. And it's just, that's, that's American land. It is, it is, it is our destiny to acquire that land and they can conform or they can get out or, you know, if, if uh, other things happen to get rid of them, hey, it is what it is. So interesting when we talk about democracy, how we, how we describe it, how do we apply it? And it's, 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 uh, when it comes to the social groups, uh, the society aspect of this theme uh, interesting what, what we mean by democracy. So I hope this presentation, this video lecture was, uh, beneficial in understanding the comparisons of Jeffersonian democracy and Jacksonian democracy. If you have any other questions, feel free. By the way, I wanted to add, I, uh, forgot to mention this when it comes back to the, uh, elections here in that remember in 1796, Adams and Jefferson, Adams, president of the federal, you know, with with the, as a federalist, and Jefferson as vice president of Democratic Republicans. Well, in 1824, John Quincy Adams had to deal with being a national Republican type Democratic Republican, and had John C. Calhoun as his vice president, who was more of a lean toward the what would become the Jacksonian Democrats. So imagine that. I mean, these are. <laughs> I mean, just the best kind of uh, coincidences you can imagine with these uh, with these elections. So, I hope this was uh, great. Any uh, questions or comments, just let me know. Contact me on the YouTube channel or in the A Pushers Facebook group or through email. Have fun.